Hello and welcome to another how-to video of Infor's PLM Discrete version 10.2. I am Brian Rockwell, PLM Solutions Architect at Rockwell Consult. Items are the backbone of PLM data, acting as the connection between CAD information and ERP data. They are the building blocks for bills of material, or BOMs, and typically are the way to express components, subassemblies, and full assemblies, and the relationship to one another. Today we will review how to create a new item and how items are connected to each other to create a bill of material. Items contain the metadata related to the part itself. If there is a connection to some ERP system, these are the data that are transferred from PLM to ERP. The item is also what is created when generating a file in a CAD system. Typically, the engineer will either create the item in PLM first to reserve the part number, or they will create the file in CAD and upon save, create the part number. Most companies will use the item ID as the part number, although that is not necessarily an absolute rule nor is it always recommended. Okay, so let's create a new item. Items are created from the item list pane or from the item structure pane depending on your preference. Manual creation of an item is done by selecting the new button. This will create a new record on the screen, however the record is not yet committed to the database. As an indicator this is a new record, a blue star is visible just to the left of the item line. The information typically provided is sufficient for creating a generic item, but most companies are looking for a lot more information. Therefore, the configuration of the system requires significant review and adjustment to create the ideal item for your business. Regardless, we will start with fundamentals using basic information and create the item structure based on what you see. When you create the new item, all visible fields are rep represented on the item pane. All mandatory fields that are hidden also appear but underneath the new record line. This is to allow you to verify that the information that is required is correct or if blank needs to be populated. You will notice that several of the fields are populated with auto number. This is to indicate some script will be filling in that information if not manually populated. Typically the item ID and revision are the major ones to watch as they are populated by what PLM calls the item mask and revision mask. Another field, the originator, is auto populated with current user which will label the record with you, the creator of the new record. All of these are the scripts that fire when the record is committed to the database. As I mentioned, they can be overwritten manually if desired, but only at record creation. After that, the values are locked and no changes can be made without checking out and creating a new record. All red start fields are mandatory. Most should be filled out by the default values template, however your company may have specific requirements that may require additional information. So now I will click save. This now commits the item to the database and we can then begin working with it to configure it to our liking. That usually means we can link it to other items or documents. More will be discussed regarding documents in another how-to video. For now, we will concentrate on the item itself and the item-to-item -item relationship. The metadata stored by the item are called attributes in PLM terms, of which many are visible, but normally can potentially be the proverbial tip of the data iceberg as many, many fields could be hidden from the user. Let's walk through some of the most important fields. Item ID and revision are the primary keys for the item record and must be unique in order for the record to exist. As mentioned before, these two are the ones that the item mask and revision mask control. If this information is being created from some CAD program, which is typically the case, 
the values are, be, are pulled automatically from the mask. Many times an exit mask may exist, which essentially is some script that fires at item creation to create some business specific number as the item ID. Sometimes a product code or a coding specification or any value that means something to someone can be used. This, however, is not standard functionality, but is a typical change done to the system based on business requirements. The status of the item starts out as undefined, meaning there are no restrictions other than what the system puts on the standard attributes. Anyone can work on the item if they have ownership to do so, which in other terms means no one has exclusive ownership of the item. Once the item is checked in, the item is said to be released and the status changes to released. At this point, no one has access to make changes to the item except in very special cases. If the item is checked out for a change, the original released item status is changed to under change and a new item exists with a new revision and is in the status of undefined. The original is still released, but people are now aware there is another revision out there somewhere. Effectivity dates are the dates that the item is valid or effective. Seems self-explanatory, but I will provide a little detail. The initial revision is given a date from the date it was created, but it has an end date of forever to indicate it is still valid. Even undefined items will have this behavior. However, when the undefined item is checked in, it will now have the start date of the checked in date. This is when the released item is now valid until forever. Only when the next item is checked in will it be superseded and the end date will be the start of the next released item. Item type is used to identify the item whether it is make or buy. In some special cases it may be transferred typically when multiple manufacturing sites or units may use parts and assemblies or even entire products interchangeably. The originator is the one who created the item. In some cases the originator may be WF underscore daemon which means the item was created by the system via a workflow. Unit of measure is typically capital E capital A for each but there are many other UOMs that can be used depending on what it is you make. These need to be exactly the same as what is found in your ERP system to avoid data corruption. For that reason, there are times a background process is created that will extract the list of UOMs from the ERP system and populate the list in PLM to make sure that there are no problems. Categories are a special section of the item that leverages additional fields that the business does not want to appear directly on the item but is still searchable. Typically these are dimensions and other engineering data that can be used to differentiate an item from others to facilitate finding the right screw or bolt. When an item is created it requires an owning project. If you have a single project this is the default. However, there may be cases where several projects are being used. In this case, the user's default project is used, or whatever is specified in the default value template. There are times you may want to change the owning project depending on the circumstances revolving around your particular business needs. We can see here that if you right click on the item and go to Open, Linked Projects, a new pane will open for that item. It is possible to relate an item to many projects, but only one project is the owner. You can see the projects the item is related to, and based on the access column, you can tell which is the owning project. All non-owning projects will be restricted. This translates to meaning if you have access to the project, you can modify the item assuming it is in an undefined state. Another how-to video will explain more of the nuances regarding project ownership 
and the benefits and detriments of single projects versus multiple projects. Now that we understand the creation and basic functionality of an item, let's create a bill of material using a few items. Again, I will use some generic items to illustrate the hierarchy of the items in a parent-child relationship. We will review a few of the panes that are important for item structures and then look at how the actual bomb structure is created and maintained. The part list pane is the place where you can see the next level down from the item selected in the item list or the children of the item. The listed items are only the next level down and nothing more. If a top level bill of material item is selected, the subassemblies would then appear in the part list, and if an assembly is selected, the assembly components would appear in the part list, assuming a small bomb. The Where Used pane will show the next level up from the selected item. This is to show the parent or parents of the item selected. If we assume a component, it would then show all the products that use that part or component. As you see, each time I select an item in the item list, the part list and where used panes will update with the information for that specific item. That is because the two are dependent or secondary panes to the item list pane. Another how to video will explain the work area and how it behaves. Typically, these two panes, the part list and the where used panes, are quick peaks or the neighbors of the part in question. For many cases, this is all that is required. However, there are many times the full bill of material is desired or the full impact of a change to one part will have on an entire product schema is desired. When you want everything that is to be seen with respect to a particular assembly or component, then you would want to open the item structure. This pane is ideal for building bills of material as it allows you to bring up your top level bill of material and then allow the drag and drop capability of PLM to shine. As you can see, I can create several items in the item list, but the item structure is not a dependent or secondary pane and is fixed on the item selected. This way, you can use the structure to see the full bill while creating the items in the item list. Once there, I can drag them into the bill of material in the location I prefer and update the information as needed. I can select quantity if I choose or update the descriptions, unit of measure, etc. from the structure pane. If one of the items is hardware, like a screw or bolt, I could use it in several levels of the bill of material. Therefore, a simple drag and drop with an update of the quantity will provide the bill of material information desired. Now let's assume we have something that is used in several locations, but we are not sure how many and need to make a change. We would like to know the impact of the change on the products we have. Here we would find the one that we will be modifying and open in a reverse structure. This now flips the parent-child relationship to a child-parent relationship, allowing us to see all the locations this part is used. This is to determine the impact of our change. Maybe we want to make one change to a single product and not the rest. Therefore, we may have to create a new part and only modify a single product structure. If that were the case, we would do something like a copy product structure and limit the changes to the one we select so that the rest are not affected. I won't go into copy product structure at this point, but we'll reserve that for another how-to video. Sometimes you may want the structure to change according to the item selected. In that case, you may want to have a linked structure where the bomb does change with the item list selection. In that case, the linked structure pane would be desired. For more information about other how-to videos, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel. To learn more about Rockwell Consults and how we can improve your manufacturing processes and data management,
go to rockwellconsults.com.